Thanks so much. Mark Costa is the chairman and chief executive officer of Eastman. Uh, really interesting company that's been doing some really innovative work around recycling and plastics. I'm delighted to welcome you here. Mark, welcome to Circularity 20. It's great to see you, Joel, and it's really exciting to be here um, and join you all virtually. Um, and it's uh, great to connect to you again. I know uh, you came to visit us here in Kingsport and see what we're doing on, on sustainability and circularity um, and uh, to be at the, this event, which is so significant on discussing this topic is really exciting for us. And it was pretty much my last time out of the house back in March. I know. So Mark, uh, Mark, uh, a lot of people don't know exactly what Eastman is. Maybe just give us a little bit of the elevator pitch. Sure. So Eastman is a spinoff of Kodak, right? For those who don't know the history. Um, so we're celebrating our 100 year anniversary. So in 1920, uh, the Eastman division was founded as part of Kodak that developed all the materials for making photographic equipment. And over that 100 years, we evolved into being a much broader uh, company, making advanced materials and additives that go into a wide range of products from transportation to building construction, durables, uh, agriculture, uh, et cetera. Um, and so we have been focused on the mission, uh, as we think about it, of enhancing the quality of life in a material way. So we continue to, to come up with additives that make things better in this world. And what I'd say though, historic, just, just to sort of add to that a little bit, historically what I'd say we did is um, really focus on the quality of life, right? But a decade ago, we changed and expanded that definition to include the environment, right? So a lot more emphasis on sustainability and every product had to meet a criteria that it was improving the environment. And we define the environment, just to be clear, as, you know, climate, water, waste, you know, all aspects in a holistic way and whatever it is we do. And just to be clear, the kinds of plastics that Eastman makes or the materials uh, are not the plastics used for soda bottles, most disposable things. They're more durable plastics, right? That's right. So that's true today. Um, if you go back in our history, uh, we played a significant role in the development and, 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 and commercialization of PET for water bottles and soda bottles all over the world. DuPont and us played a large role. Uh, but we exited that business back in uh, 2011. So really the last decade of all of our innovation, especially on the plastics part of our business, is focused more on consumer durables, whether it's appliances or sunglasses or medical applications, et cetera, electronics. Um, but you, our single use plastic part of our business is extremely small. So over the past year or so, you've been developing some, uh, some processes uh, called chemical recycling to bring, turn plastic back into plastic. Yeah. And uh, it's a little bit controversial, but tell me why you see chemical recycling uh, that we're talking about this here at a circular economy conference. Yeah, so I think that the chemical recycling part, you know, is a sub question of a much bigger question, which is, should plastics play a role in the environment? And if so, you know, how do we get it to have a much better, more friendly um, environmental impact on the environment, right? So if you think about plastic, you know, they played a role for a reason, right? So they've, you know, enhance the quality of products, right? Because they bring uh, affordability, durability, chemical resistance, light weighting, you know, all these different features that make, you know, the role they played, whether it was water or food packaging or whatever else, you know, better food, you know, yield and food preserving, you know, delivering safe water, et cetera. Um, so they played an important role. Um, and that affordability was a, something that people don't always think about, which is the reason it's affordable a big part of it is because the energy required to make it and transport because it's very lightweight is very attractive. You know, it's economical. Uh, that also means it has a low carbon footprint. And the question we have to get caught up in here sometimes is, well, we have a serious waste problem when it comes to plastic and we have not done the job we should have in capturing it and reusing all that carbon that we're just letting go to waste in the environment. It did actually perform a functional role. And, and there, I know there's a number of people out there who would say, you know, we should, you know, maybe not use plastic. Well, if you're not use plastic, then what are you going to use? Is it really going to be better for the environment in a holistic definition, not just on the waste question, but also on climate and water? And when you look at PT, for example, which we know fairly well, you know, glass and aluminum, which would be some of the classic alternatives, or even these, you know, highly coated paper products, are worse for the environment when you do a life cycle on carbon footprint, impact on water, and everything else. So, you know, getting rid of one thing, it doesn't make the environment better if we end up having to use something worse. 
right? So there's a lot of places where I think plastic needs to play a role and can be really valuable if we can address the waste question. If we don't address the waste question, then you know we have a real challenge um, in this. And to be clear, we're looking at durable. So all of our recycling, as we look at it, is taking waste plastic and converting it into polymer that goes into durable. So we're not, try I'm not trying to defend single use plastic. I think we should reduce it as much as possible, but it's still gonna be necessary. And I think plastic can play a good role in it. So how do we recycle it? And so where does chemical recycling fit into all this? So, you know, today when you say recycling, they think mechanical recycle is the solution and how we should do this. And it is a very energy efficient way to approach it. You know, the uh, mechanical approach is you take clean plastic, you chop it up, you melt it, you know, and, and, and so that's very efficient. The problem with mechanical recycling, and the reason recycling is very limited is that, you know, you have to have very clean plastic. You know, you, and then when you reprocess it, you start having color issues, integrity issues. You can only do it so many times because it starts to structurally break down. And so that limits the role mechanical recycling by itself can play. So chemical recycling plays a role in filling that broader gap, right? So the plastic that can't be easily mechanically recycled is still gonna end up in, in the waste dump or worse in the environment. So we've got to have a solution to that. And, and what we call molecular recycling, not chemical recycling, because what you're, you're not really, you know, you know, making chemicals, what you're doing uh, is breaking plastic down back into its molecules and then rebuilding that back into a new plastic. And, and the beauty of that and the way we do it is that, you know, it's very energy efficient, low carbon footprint relative to fossil fuel. Um, and it, you, you purify the molecules to the extent that the new plastic that you make is identical to the original. So no performance trade-offs, you know, great structural integrity, and it's infinite. Like aluminum, you know, you can continually redo, you know, re, re, reuse the material over and over again. So it is a complement to molecular, you know, to mechanical recycling where we can take the rest of that plastic and use it and create value from it you know, to solve the total plastic solution. So just to be clear, is molecular recycling the same as chemical recycling? Do you just use a different name for it? It is, um, you know, the, I think that we got, you know, stuck with using those terms, you know, but it's really not accurate in reflecting what it is. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of so, different versions of it out there. And so I think it's important to understand that they're not all created equal and some are better for the environment than others. Yeah, well, th there was a report out not too long ago, I think Greenpeace or some other NGOs put it out saying that this is not really a thing. It's technically possible, but it's really 10 years off. You're saying that's not true. Uh, well, it's not true at all. Um, the fact is we're commercial at scale today now in doing, uh, you know, molecular recycling with two separate technologies. Uh, so one around polyester and one around cellulosic biopolymers, both of which where we're already used millions of pounds of waste, uh, plastic and made product and gone commercial with it. Um, you know, so it, it is it is very much today and now. Now, there are questions that have been asked around how can it be scaled up? Um, and there are a lot of people in the early pilot stage of doing this technology. So I think we are ahead of a lot of the industry, but it's been around forever, right? So methanolysis, which is how you sort of unzip a polymer, a polyester polymer, you know, Kodak practiced it for 25 years, you know, a long time ago. Um, I was engineering uh, this as a project that we were gonna build in 2010 um, and got very close to sort of completing the engineering to build it. Right? and. It didn't happen because the market demand and the value of this idea wasn't there. Now it very much is. So part of the very historically isn't technology. It's actually very straightforward. It's the market consumers and the brands want it and demand it and will pay for it. Um, so it's very scalable. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that it can be done now. The key is you got to do it in a way that's good for the total environment. So we're focused on uh, technologies that you know, not only get waste out of the environment, but we require it to have a lower fossil fuel, you know, lower carbon footprint than fossil fuels, you know, because otherwise it's not really recycling. Um, and so each, each of our technologies are 20 to 50% better depending on the feedstock than doing it uh, with the fossil fuel process. Yeah, so there's an element here, Mark, that almost sounds too good to be true, that you've got this technology that can turn plastic back into plastic at the molecular level infinitely, as you say, much like we can with aluminum, that's already being done at scale. Why hasn't anybody done this? What's keeping this from really becoming the dominant way uh, we handle used plastics? 
So I think that, you know, there's been a couple of barriers historically, I think all of which are starting to be addressed now. So the first was something I just mentioned, which is consumer demand. You know, consumers have to want this and demand it. Um, and they have to recognize that, you know, to make these investments requires capital investment. So the cost of it is going to be somewhat higher, not a lot higher, but a little bit higher. But can, can we stop there for a second? Sure. That's, I mean, consumers don't generally demand recycled plastics or let alone a product made. I mean, they may, you know, could brand one of your, one of the plastics that you make for say an Algene or Camelback uh, water bottle. They may say, I want one made from that as uh, much as people you know, ask for, yeah. uh, I don't know, different branded materials. But I'm not sure the consumer demand for recycled plastics is going to drive this. Do you, do you think that's really going to be the case? Yeah, I think it's happening now. I think it's a combination of three things, right? So it's consumers wanting more environmentally responsible products, right? They don't say, I want to recycle content product. They just say, I want products that are safe. You know, I want it to be BPA free, now styrene free. You know, I want, you know, the product to be low impact on the environment. They care deeply about that. Um, and then you have the brands responding to what consumers want, saying, hey, we've got to, you know, change our portfolio. And they're all committing to recycle content or bio, you know, compostable content, whatever the case may be, but more environmentally friendly products. And then you have governments saying, we need policy because our voters care about this, you know, that drives the right set of behavior. And you see all three of those things coming together, especially in Europe right now, driving change, right? That didn't exist 10 years ago when I wanted to build this the first time, right? right. Um, so you've got conditions in, in, you know, on that front. Now, the, the second challenge is infrastructure, right? So as much as we may want to you know recycle and, and close this loop you got to have recycling facilities that can capture the material and make it available to companies like us to then recycle it and then supply it to the brands uh, and and so there's a lot of investments and partnerships necessary with the brands as well as the recycling infrastructure where we're spending a lot of time working on that because one of the biggest limitations oddly is getting the material you know despite all of it in landfill that we don't want uh, it's it's not easy to access it as it should be, um, yeah. and so and the, you're, you're for example you're sourcing uh, used carpeting when a, which is shipped to Eastman's Tennessee factory in a pelletized yeah. form from California. Right. Is that is that pencil out environmentally? It does right. So when we do our life cycle analysis, our carbon footprint analysis of this technology versus fossil fuel, we do it cradle to gate. So we're including all the transportation of the raw materials getting to where we are, no matter where they come from in our analysis. That's why it goes from 20 to 50%, depends on which polymer and where it's coming from, you know, on how it compares to fossil fuels, uh, but they're all better. Um, and uh, it's a great partnership. I think uh, what we're doing with circular polymers is a great example where California put in policy to drive uh, a take back program of carpet and, and put value on it getting collected and recycled they've got a good way to really densify that polymer um, so that it's very efficient tr from a transportation point of view to get it to us and then we can use it. Um, so I think that's, that's a good example. And there's, a, we're doing that with a lot of municipalities that are closer by to us. Um, and we're even doing take back programs globally, for example, in ophthalmics with a company called Matza Kelly that makes all the sheet polymer for sunglasses and eyeglasses. Yeah. Um, and so they're going to send it, we're going to, you know, put it in the front end of our process and then send them that plastic back. So it's a true circular loop. Right. And you bring up one good point, which is that your customers are not consumers. Your customers are brands that make eyeglasses or in some cases fashion or uh, I mentioned uh, Camelback and Nalgene uh, yeah. water bottles or, or two of them. So in a very short time we have left, how, what do we need to do? What's the, the one thing that needs to happen that will get this to scale? I think that we need collaboration, right? So I think, you know, there's a lot of people on the environmental NGO side who deeply understand this issue and care a lot about making both the climate and waste, you know, a better solution than where we are today. The brands need to come together and the infrastructure and policymakers. We need to have fact-based, science-based conversations about how we solve these problems. We need to realize that mechanical recycling is limited. So molecular recycling is a necessary part to get to scale and solve this problem. And we need to understand that, you know, plastic is part of the solution. And if we're not careful, we could drive to other materials that are gonna be much worse for the environment. And this is happening now. It's not a pipe dream. It's not 10 years out. We just like, you know, license Triton Renew, which is our BPA free plastic for, you know, a lot of durable applications. It's actually this glass right here um, that, you know, Nalgene and Camelback just launched. 
Um, we're doing it with Naya, which is in textile fiber. So we got a biopolymer that'll be half biopolymer, now half recycled content, where we're launching, launching that into the textile industry. And it's all being made from waste plastic. You know, and uh, if we were actually in person, uh, we'd be handing these classes out. But you can actually go to a URL, which is uh, Eastman at, you know, at Eastman.com um, or www.eastman.com, you know, slash circularity, and you can get your own complimentary glass. Um, but the point is, is this real? It's now, it's happening. Um, and, and it's very much scalable. I think we're going to go from 50 million pounds here in the short term, 250 million pounds, you know, five years from now to more than 500 million pounds in the next decade. Wow, it sounds promising. Uh, yeah, eastman.com slash circularity, get your own recycled plastic, uh, but looks like glass actually, yeah. uh, a cup. Um, uh, this sounds very exciting, very promising. It also points out the complexity of what it takes to get an innovation like this uh, to scale in the market and all the different levers that you have to pull to make that happen. But we look forward to catching up and hearing more as you progress. Mark Costa, CEO of Eastman. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, Joel. It's great seeing you again. Looking forward to having you out here again. Mm -hmm.